welcome to the Renaissance Ranch quarterly addiction recovery webinar. We are so grateful that you're here tonight to join us. We know we have a lot of our family members from the ranch. We have a lot of people I know joining new tonight um, through social media. We have a lot of our family members who have reached out to their extended family members. And we're just so glad that you're here. We are super grateful for our speakers tonight. Every single one of us on this call have had addiction either personally or within the family system, whether it's within the spousal relationship or in the parental relationship. And we are grateful to have clinicians and to have Carolyn Howard with us, our professional mediator that's gonna give us some tips on uh, relationship conflict, which is the reported number one cause of relapse with those who are struggling with addiction. And we are um, wanted to just share a little bit about our program at the Renaissance Ranch. We are really, um, it's very important to us that we try to help the whole family system. We know that addiction is a family illness, affects everyone in the family. And the research indicates that the more people that get involved in learning about recovery and the tools that the more successful um, our loved ones that are in treatment or that are struggling with addiction, the more successful they can be and the longer they can maintain their sobriety. Um, we are grateful for the 12 steps that originated in the founders of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous back in the 1930s. And you're going to hear stories of healing, highlights of healing tonight. And so with that, we're just going to start with a word of prayer and just appreciate so much. Um, Matt, are you okay to give us the prayer tonight? Yeah, Thank you so sure. Thank you so, so much. We you just, uh, part of the 12 steps that makes it so powerful is the higher power concept. And we know that looks different for everyone and that all of you are joining from all around the country. Um, and so we just encourage you to try to find that higher power, uh, whether it's the power of the group or people that are a little longer uh, along the pathway of recovery than you are, or however you term your, your God or your savior, or whatever that looks like for you. And we encourage our panelists tonight to speak freely of their higher power because that is the strength of the 12 step um, success that we know has held millions of alcoholics throughout the world and their family members. So thank you so much, Matt. Appreciate that, that prayer. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Our Father in heaven, as we humbly bow our heads before thee on this Tuesday night, we're grateful for the many blessings and opportunities that thou continues to bestow upon us. And Father, indeed, grateful for this opportunity we have to gather as friends and family tonight and to discuss re recovery and what we can do to help support each other and help each other become our highest and best selves. And Father, we pray to have thy spirit to be here tonight and that hearts may be softened and that messages may be received and, and where we can best um, serve one another and pray to have thy spirit uh, to be with us and, and guide and protect us always is our prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Matt. So um, 10 years ago, we started doing family education groups. And honestly, we would get like seven to 10 to 20 people. And then when COVID hit, we all had to become a little more educated with technology. Uh, last month, I think we had 626 attendees to our family groups, which we now have six and four of them are open to the public. We will be starting some more family groups soon. Um, but we know that people are needing hope these days. Like we need to know how to heal physically, emotionally, and within our relationships and spiritually. So just so grateful that you're with us tonight. I'd like to turn the time over to my sweetheart, to Rick Dixon, and he's going to introduce the speakers. And um, Yes, sir. So Thank fun. you, honey. And I'm just grateful uh, that everybody's here, grateful for the speakers. Uh, I know that many have come here with heavy hearts to listen and with a prayer in their heart to, to learn what to do when they don't know what to do. Um, and hopefully between our speakers, there will be some answers for you and some guidance and some hope. Um, throughout the, these speakers, there's gonna be things that will come to your mind and you wanna to ask questions. Um, please put in the chat the questions that you have as they come up. At the end, we're going to take several minutes to address your questions. Uh, if you want to address a question to a specific speaker, feel free to. If you just want to give a question to a uh, just to, to the group, go ahead and we'll kind of point it to where we feel it might uh, make some sense or have one or two people answer. Um, so please know that 
question and answers are a critical part of these webinars and they are just fantastic as we get into it so uh, please post your questions not necessarily at the end but just as they come up put the questions in there uh, again we've got some neat speakers uh, most of you i'm sure have seen the lineup and uh, we're going to start with uh, steve and jamie smith hey how you know how a person overcomes an addiction when they have been addicted for a quarter of a century is pretty darn miraculous. And that is Steve Smith's story. Uh, he's going to share his story, but what's neat is Jamie, his wife, and her support. And you'll hear from her as well. The thing that we learned is the best thing we could do as family members is to work on our own selves, our, our own recovery. And she'll address some of that as well. So uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Steve, if you want to unmute, and uh, why don't you uh, go ahead and you've got to, you know, 10 to, to 15 minutes and then uh, we can turn it over to Jamie and, and, uh, and, and just go from there. Uh, Steve, you're on. Thank you, Steve. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the introduction. Um, my name is Steve and I'm an alcoholic. Um, I think that's an appropriate way for me to start uh, my, what we have to share tonight. So I, I've thought a lot about um, tonight and what my wife and I can share with this group about our journey um, through addiction and recovery, the highs, the lows. Um, and the main thing that keeps coming to my mind is um, that, that there is hope. And this is coming from a, a, a guy, a family, that there were so many times when we had no hope, no hope at all. Um, I know that I personally, there was nothing that I wanted more than to get out of my addiction um, and just live a normal life. And um, I absolutely um, was in a place for quite a few years where I thought that was impossible. Um, so as, as I start kind of telling about like what it was like in my life um, and our life, um, where we've been, what we've been through and how we got to where we're at now, um, you know, I hope that you can see and feel that there is hope, no matter how far gone um, you are or a loved one, you feel they are, that there is hope. Um, because I, I, um, I'm a walking miracle of that or a testament of that. So kind of just to give you a little bit of background of where, where I'm from, um, more about me. So I grew up in Utah. I grew up in a, a very religious household. Um, have a great mom and dad, a lot of uh, brothers and sisters that I love and appreciate and have great relationships with. Um, my abuse of drugs and alcohol started when I was a sophomore in high school. And I think it's important to, to go back to that first time I used drugs and alcohol and the feelings that, I, that um, came to me. So I remember before I took my first drink of alcohol, I was adamantly against it. Um, kind of a, a very typical story. I was at a friend's house. There were some older kids there drinking. Um, and up until that point, it hadn't even crossed my mind. But I fell to peer pressure. And um, the, my friend's older brothers, they um, peer pressured me into drinking beer. And I remember that first time I drank that I, um, as interesting as this sounds, I didn't feel guilty about it. I didn't feel bad about it. I remember the thought very clearly coming to my mind of why on earth has everyone told me my whole life how bad this is? Because when I drank, all of a sudden, I felt normal. I felt like I, I imagined everyone else felt. All my insecurities left me. Um, I could talk to girls. I felt like I was funny. Um, and all of these things that... Um, were holding me down that I felt like were holding me down as a teenage boy, um, struggling to find my way to fit in in the world, um, those things disappeared. And I remember thinking, well, you know, if my parents told me drinking alcohol was wrong and bad, and, um, and I did my own investigation and I thought it was great, um, I finally felt like the rest, uh, well, what I thought the rest of the world felt like, which was just normal, that what else out there is there? And so that, I started experimenting with other drugs um, and went down that road and I it spiraled really quickly. Um, I cleaned up when I was um, about 18 years old um, and served a, a, 
a mission for my church for two years um, and came home and met my beautiful wife, Jamie, uh, shortly after um, I was around 21 years old when we met. And at this point, uh, drugs and alcohol were not even a part of my life. Um, it, they didn't, it didn't even cross my mind. Well, um, I played college football and I, um, I had a bad back. I was injured after my sophomore year. Um, I, I hurt my back and they told me uh, that I should be done playing football. Well, in my mind, that wasn't an option. And I want you, uh, as I'm talking throughout this, um, I want you to think about a question that I was asked all the time when I went to Renaissance Ranch. And that question is, so Steve, are drugs your problem or your solution? And I, I thought, even um, when I was in patient, I thought they were my the problem. If I could not use drugs, then everything else would go away. So going back to the, the injury with my football, um, they told me I should be done playing. Well, I found painkillers and I got, I could get them prescribed from a doctor and I started taking um, the prescript or the pills regularly as prescribed, but I took them regularly. And I remember after a month or so, the first time I, I was, I was sitting in class, I remember exactly where I was and I started to feel sick. And um, all of a sudden I thought to myself, wait a second, am I getting addicted to these? I just remember that word. I didn't even know what that meant, but am I getting addicted to these? And sure enough, I was. And so fast forward through that time um, and I, I continued to take pills. I had other injuries during football. And so the, the um, pain pills got stronger and stronger. Um, and I was taking them regularly to the point where if I wasn't taking them, I was, I was feeling sick, but at the time, um, I was playing football and it was just kind of normal. It wasn't that big of a deal. My wife was aware of it. Um, it was kind of what I had to do. So graduate from there and I get out in the real world and we move up to, um, from Southern Utah up to Northern Utah. And, um, I, I find myself in a job where, um, I, I, it wasn't very fulfilling to me and I was still taking the pills because I had a bad back. And at this point, I really started to abuse the pills and take a lot more than what were prescribed. And um, kind of the, the very typical story there, I'd start to uh, go and fill my prescriptions early, find ways around that. And um, I was taking, you know, far too many opiates uh, than I should have been taking. And people ask me all the time, so were you taking these pills to get high? And the interesting thing was, is I viewed it as I wasn't taking them to get high. I was taking the pills to feel normal. And um, if I didn't take the pills, I was sick and in bed. And so um, as the problem progressed, uh, my wife and I, our relationship, I started lying to her so much. Um, I lied to her about everything, uh, where I was going, who I was with, because most of the time I was, um, you know, out trying to, to buy pills, um, get pills. Was, the doctors would, um, I, I couldn't get more, as many pills as I needed from the doctors. So I tried doing the Suboxone route. I did Suboxone. They told me I'd be off it in uh, four months, two and a half years after, uh, later. I was taking it. I was abusing it far more than I um, was prescribed. And so then I started buying pills on the street. And this is when things got really bad because it was an expensive habit. And my wife kept telling me that, uh, you know, like, hey, you're spending so much money on these pills. And I, I didn't believe it, but... Um, now with a clear head, I can see back, like I was spending at least a hundred dollars a day on pills. Um, and I had a job I was, at the time I was running a company. Um, and I just kept taking more and more pills. I was, I would steal money from my wife. I would steal money from my kids. And, um, I was meeting regularly with, uh, a leader in my church and he was trying to, you know, help me to get over this. And he'd tell me, hey, you just need to, to pray more. Um, you need to have more faith. And that was discouraging me. That just made me uh, feel more shame and guilt about what I was doing because it wasn't helping. I wasn't able to stop. I didn't think there was a way for me to be able to stop. And so this continues on. And it, it was going um, from the time I was about 22 um, until 37. And this is when things really got bad. Um, I remember the night that... Uh, my wife, Jamie, we sat down at our kitchen table and she put in front of me some separation papers and says, I, I don't want to do this, but I have to protect our family from you. And the thing that hurt the most about that was I knew she was right. That at that point in time, I was a threat to my family. 
I was a threat to our financial welfare. Um, I was meeting with uh, people that who knows what they were capable of doing. But at this point, I still couldn't stop. Um, I, I couldn't stop. I had tried uh, multiple other uh, rehab programs, um, church programs. I'd gone to AA. And I remember thinking, like, when I went to my first AA meeting before I went to the ranch, I remember thinking, looking around the room and just thinking, man, I, I'm glad that my life isn't as bad as these guys um, in here because I still had I still had a job, and a wife and, and a home. And we were, we were making everything look perfect on the outside. Um, but on the inside, we were falling apart. That's the bottom line. I remember very clearly having these feelings quite often. I'd be laying in bed at night trying to fall asleep and just praying to God that someone would come knock on our door and rescue us, um, rescue us from me. And that, that was a terrible feeling. Um, so after uh, flunking out of a lot of different rehab centers, AA not working, I was at a point where I thought there was absolutely no hope at all. I just thought a guy like me doesn't recover. I'm going to die from this or just end up living on the streets. And, and I was, I kind of had accepted that. Well, um, something happened. I um, uh, put some personal expenses to purchase drugs on a company account. And I ended up, uh, I was at a different job. I ended up getting fired from my job. And I went home. Um, I, I got fired around noon and I ended up trying to, uh, I drove around the rest of the day crying in my car, um, feeling bad for myself, and then went home around 5.30, the normal time I'd get home. And I couldn't tell my wife um, that I had gotten fired over drugs um, because I was certain that she was just going to kick me out at that point. And um, the next morning when she took the kids to school, I said, hey, when you get home, I need to tell you. Uh, I have something I need to tell you. And she said, uh, so she got home and I told her, hey, I got fired and here's why. And she looked at me and she very calmly said, well, you know what this means, right? And I, I didn't know what it meant. Um, I thought she, she was gonna say, pack your bags and get out. But she said to me, she said, you need to get some help, some real help. And I had done other outpatient programs, but I'd never done inpatient programs. And at this point in time, I was at that point of surrender where I was willing to do anything because I knew it was either do what my wife asked me or I was gonna be homeless and without a family. And so, we toured a bunch of facilities around uh, the state of Utah and we, we found Renaissance Ranch. And my personal belief is that um, it was divinely inspired that we were led there. Um, uh, I went to Renaissance Ranch and I remember um, still thinking that it wasn't going to work for a guy like me. Um, had phenomenal counselors that I, I'm, I'm still close friends with today. And Really, I think the unique part about Renaissance Ranch is what's going on right here is that other programs that I tried, it was all about treating me the addict. Um, and it was kind of like how Jamie could learn how to help me, how to help me, what was wrong with me. Well, at Renaissance Ranch, um, they had a family program. And I remember a night that Jamie had gone down, um, driven down to Bluffdale, and she was walking out of a family group. and we were coming in from somewhere and I saw her and she came up to me and she was crying, um, crying from like the depths of her soul. And um, I asked her what's wrong. And she said, I realize that I'm an addict just like you are. I'm addicted to codependence, uh, perfectionism. And she, she said, I'm an addict just like you are. And I feel like that's the real unique part of where our journey in recovery um, as a family starts. And that's a good point, I guess, where I can kind of hand it off to Jamie um, and let her kind of tell her story about um, what things were like and what they're like now. Um, so that moment that he's talking about, um, he uh, he was explaining where I walked out and felt like I was an addict. I had just gone to my first meeting. Um, I had gotten a phone call saying that I could go to these meetings and I was um, a little hesitant because I'd been to a meeting in other programs. And my experience with that meeting before was sitting in a room with the addicts, with the alcoholics and family members, which there wasn't a lot of family support. And it was, it was hard. It was really hard to be in this meeting. So I attended this first meeting and I sat in there and I just looked around as they were sharing. And I thought, wait, I don't, maybe I'm in a meeting with addicts again because people were talking about their own recovery and what step they were on and um, 
where they were at and how they were, um, you know, working a recovery program. And I raised my hand and I said, I think I might be in the wrong meeting. I thought this was family members and they all just, you know, patiently walked me through and showed me that um, we don't talk about drugs and alcohol in these meetings. We are here for us. And, you know, what got me to that initial meeting is not what kept me and has kept me going to meetings ever since. Um, I heard a beautiful story my first time in a meeting. Um, somebody who was, you know, um, really strong in their religion and had she had basically was practically perfect in every way and never had done anything wrong. And her husband became an alcoholic and she kicked him out and um, she over time said you can come back if you never drink again well uh 30 years later she um got in a dark place herself and she um her husband was traveling all the time her kids were were moved out and she be um she drank her first drink of alcohol and became an instant alcoholic and um she just said i just don't know how i wasn't an alcoholic before that i just had never drank it and all of a sudden, uh, I just felt my heart and my spirit just on fire. And it, those words just rang so true to me of, wow, she did everything right. She kept her family together. She's the reason that they're still a family. And and that happened to her later, so late in her life. And I instantly had this feeling of thinking, wow, what if that were to happen to me? And I, I suddenly got so grateful I was in that meeting. I thought, wow, I'm glad I'm here before something like that ever happened to me because I'm, um, as she told me, you know, nobody ever plans to become an alcoholic. And she she despised the alcoholic. She was disgusted by the behaviors and the choice to ever drink alcohol or um, ever put something in your body that would cause you harm. And that's how I felt. Um, I hated addiction. I hated, um, I never ever would have wished um, addiction upon my worst enemy. Um, but in that moment, I suddenly felt like I was grateful actually to be in that meeting and not in the treatment program. Um, so um, I heard the statistics of um, the um, the rate and the, the chances of a family member sticking to their recovery and overcoming this and healing if uh, family members also got into recovery. And I all of a sudden just saw why. Um, it went from him being just, you know, making poor choices and, uh, and sinning and making bad choices and me being just so perfect and doing everything right to all of a sudden, we were at this level right here. We were both, we were both addicts and our symptoms were different. Um, as I began to learn and get into my recovery journey and learn about codependency and learn about shame and um, controllers and fixers. And um, I realized that, oh, I have so many addictive tendencies in me. I actually come from a family um, who struggle and suffer from the disease of, of addiction and addictive tendencies and addictive behaviors. And I realized, oh my goodness, I have addictive tendencies and behaviors. And I'm just so grateful. I didn't start drinking alcohol or I wasn't um, injured and put on pain medication regularly. I just, it, it scared me to the point of, I thought I could be here. I could, this could be me when before that I thought I would never do such a thing. How could you, how could you be so dumb to make such poor choices? I thought it was my job all those years to show him how stupid he was being, to show him how he was ruining our family, how he was ruining everything. He had everything going for him. I thought it was my job to shame him better and to show him how much better he could be. And suddenly after these first few meetings, my heart began to shift from looking down on him. And actually my heart started turning just to my savior and to my higher power. My, my higher power is God and Jesus Christ. And um, I read a scripture that says all things point to Christ. And I truly strongly believe that addiction is, uh, points to Christ. It has pointed me to Christ and to my higher power and to my God in a way that nothing else ever has been able to. And, um, I suddenly saw this as a gift 
which I never, ever in a million years would have imagined I could have seen that as a gift. I saw this as an opportunity for me to grow closer to my Savior, Jesus Christ, and to um, to heal and recover myself. I didn't even know that I needed recovery. Um, so as my recovery journey went on, I um, shortly... I mean, real quickly realized that I was codependent. I read codependent no more. And I realized I was codependent. I read healing the shame that binds us and realized this shame, the deep rooted shame that has been passed down from so many generations in my family and in all of us. And I recognized, I just started this self-awareness just began, began in me. And I went to, um, the ranch every week. I never missed. I, at first, I thought that um, there was no way I had four little kids at home. <laughs> One little baby and these older girls. And I had, since Steve had lost his job, I had to uh, go to work full time as a nurse. And here I was training at a new job and learning um, a new position. I was um trying to keep them afloat running our finances running our home alone he was gone for months and i told our counselor i said i don't i don't have the time for this it's an hour drive a three-hour meeting an hour drive back home and you want me now to go to Al-Anon meetings i'm like i can't possibly pick up an another meeting and she said then pick up another one even more if, if you don't have time for one then maybe you need a few more she said your kids your family don't need you right now they need your recovery and that just hit so, so hard to me because I realized, oh my goodness, she's right. I need, they need my healing. They need my heart. And I learned that when one heart starts to heal, all the other hearts around it start to heal too. And um, so I did, I committed myself to going to these meetings. It didn't feel easy, but the more I went, the more I, I started to see the miracles in it. I thought for sure my kids needed to get the therapy. I thought they needed healing. They needed this work. Do you have meetings for them? What can they do? And she said, the best thing you can do is work on yourself and their hearts will start to heal too. And so that's what we did at first. And, um, and Steve didn't move home for almost six months. The ranch had such wonderful counselors that we were meeting with regularly. I was going to my own therapy. I was going to you know, the, the therapy groups with Steve and they encouraged us to, um, have him go to sober living afterwards, which I thought was insane. And I know Steve has some great things. I'm sure he could say about that too, but he thought, um, he was ready to come home. He needed to get home and get a job and get back into our life. And, and, uh, thank heavens. I had now something that I had never had before. And that's a support group. That's other people to turn to in 15 years of him struggling with addiction, 10 years of me really feeling, knowing he's an addict and feeling like helpless and five years of that, just, just hell feeling like I have nobody to turn to. I am for sure the only person in the entire world who's ever experienced this and gone through this. Nobody would ever know. I have to write a book one day to going to meetings and realizing, oh my goodness, that me too, me too. Oh my gosh, me too. And feeling not alone. Like this was such a miracle, such a miracle. I had people in my circle who not only were just good listeners, but good advice givers and could help me and point us in the right direction. So they pointed us to um, having Steve go to sober living, which I never, ever would have chosen for ourselves. And um, our um, good counselors in recovery were so good to tell us it only works what, 99% of the time? 99.9. Yeah. I was like, oh, so he should be okay coming. He could be okay coming home. <laughs> um, no, he, he went to sober living. And uh, during this time, um, I kind of got to a place in my recovery. And, and I didn't realize this in myself, but I actually picked up a, as soon as I started letting go of Steve's addiction, and my addiction to his addiction, I had no idea how much of my mind and energy and time that was taking up, um, tracking him, becoming basically a, a professional detective and, and all of that. Um, I, I also started letting go of my codependency. And as I did this, I picked up an addiction to food. 
food became something to numb my feelings. Um, dealing with feelings was something that I've never done before in my life. I preferred to just have fun, um, you know, make everybody in our family appear like we're doing great and everything's fine. I preferred to serve and take care of everybody else. And as soon as I started recognizing how I was numbing out, I started uh, letting go of all of those things, but picked up something new that I had never picked up before. And that was food and um, discovered that I had a eating disorder. And, um, but then again, once the, the same thing, I had a support group. I had a counselor in recovery. I knew exactly what to do. And part of me thought, wow, what if this came up in my life before I was already in recovery? It was a miracle that I already had the resources. I already had something available to help me through this. And it actually, so I, I worked on that with counselors and really the, the, the reality is I just got back to my recovery. Um, it was no different. Our, our symptoms are different, but the, um, the malady is the same, the the disease is the same, the shame, the codependency was all the same. So it actually helped eliminate the shame. I um, didn't need to shame myself for turning to food. Um, I realized we all turn to something and I've turned to something my whole life. It just has never been alcohol or drugs or food. It's um, been things that look very socially acceptable and kind of actually made me look like the hero. I was addicted to, um, uh, being the hero and saving the day and um, going through so much and how do you do it, you know, and that fed my, fed my ego. Well, um, the last thing I want to talk about is how I have been able to work through the steps and how it has really just healed my heart and just fully pointed me to my higher power. Um, I recently, just this last weekend, actually had the opportunity to um, work my um, I've, I've been working on a fearless moral inventory step four for quite some time now, a lot longer than maybe uh, most people might. Um, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist and I just felt like I wanted to get through so many layers. And that moral inventory was so eye opening, showing me character defects, showing me um, places in my life where I could make amends and um, places that I could improve. Um, honestly, it just was a self-improvement process. And this weekend I was able to do a step five. I actually have two sponsors. I have a sponsor in my 12 steps and I have a sponsor from the ranch who is, I call my heart sponsor. And then I have another, uh, these sponsors, I was able to work a step five with both of them this weekend. And through this beautiful process of being able to share and be vulnerable of all the things in these character defects that I wanted to remove. And then I was able to walk through beautiful meditation where I took all of these character defects and handed them over to the Savior. And I realized that I was carrying things that were not for me to carry. This was our Savior's job. This was Christ's job to carry this for me. And it, I didn't need to carry this anymore. And I was able to basically pull this out of my heart and cleanse this and hand this over. And the freeing, it was so freeing. I felt so light. I felt so good and I felt like this is has pointed me to my higher power stronger than anything else ever has. And the beautiful miracle in this is that um, when both of us got into recovery, our kids started to know a difference. You know, they say that Al-Anon AA is a, is a program of attraction rather than promotion. And um, even though there were so many things I thought I needed to do to save my kids, to fix my kids, to teach them all these principles, and I had mentioned this before, I realized that I only needed to work on myself. Our kids really quickly saw that. We have 15-year-old, 14-year-old, 8-year-old, um, and then two little toddlers right now. So we have five kids. And um, our kids really quickly got into recovery as well. They joined us in recovery, and they um, there's Alateen for them. And uh, when I tell people about Alateen, they still can't believe that um, this is something free for my kids to go to. They're learning principles of... Um, owning their own feelings and not taking on other people's, what they're responsible for and what they're in control of and what they're not. These are just beautiful, miraculous principles that I don't know that they would have otherwise learned. Um, I feel like maybe they would have had to face hardship like we have to learn these principles. And I just think what a beautiful, miraculous gift that they have been able to learn these principles because of what we've gone through and because we were willing to um, turn our hearts to 
our higher power completely and turn it over. Our kids have followed us and they go to their meetings regularly. And they, we have, as a family, like I said, when one heart starts to heal, all the other hearts around us start to heal too. And I can't even count, I couldn't even begin to tell you how many people, just because of our willingness to share, have turned to us and asked for help and advice. And um, we've been able to point them to Al-Anon. We've been able to refer so many people to Renaissance Ranch, a program that has included our whole family and, and saved our family, saved our lives and um, truly made a eternal impact on our family. We're so grateful for that. So thank you for letting us share. Um, and I guess we'll just turn the time back over to you guys. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Steve and Jamie. Uh, Steve and Jamie, that was awesome. Amazing. Very, very, very powerful. Very inspiring. Um, thank you. You know, uh, uh, talking about boundaries, uh, Steve, when you said she, she showed the separation pain, papers, you know, until the pain of the consequence is greater than the pain of recovery, we don't actually go into recovery. So she, she learned some boundaries there. I love, Jamie, when you talked about letting go of my addiction to his addiction. That's what recovery partly is all about. Uh, I love when you said kids don't need you right now. They need your recovery. And, and look what's happened with your family, with your kids. And we'll come back to some questions here in a bit. We'll talk a little bit about Alateine in, in just a bit. So exciting Steve. about that. Steve, thank you. Thank you for being so vulnerable and, and Jamie as well. Thank you for your recovery example. That gives yes, us a lot yes. of hope. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Next is, is Carolyn Howard. If, Carolyn, if you want to unmute and put your video on. Uh, you know, Carolyn is an incredible woman. Uh, she, uh, for UVU, she's a professor there that um, works in conflict uh, resolution. A lot of conflict in, in this uh, arena is, is uh, something that, that happens. What's interesting, though, with Carolyn is that she's had a lot of experience, sadly to say, with addiction on both sides of the family. And there's been extended me me uh, members of the family that have passed because of addiction. She understands it. She's been educated with some real tools, though, that we thought would be very, well, invaluable in helping us. So with that, let's turn some time over to our main speaker, Carolyn. And again, those of you who are listening, who have questions, feel free to put in the chat your questions and we'll uh, uh, be doing question and answers at the end of this uh, webinar uh, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So Carolyn, uh, you're on. Carolyn, thank uh, thanks you for being so with much us. for being with us tonight, Carolyn. You're welcome and thank you, Steve and Jamie and particularly you too for, um, for giving me this opportunity. I am uh, very, um, nervous about it, but I appreciate the opportunity. In a discussion I had with my daughter, um, who is currently in the addiction recovery process, she made a simple statement that changed my thinking about how I was going to share some thoughts with all of you today. I must admit that I've struggled to determine how to approach this time, and you'll have to forgive me if I'm going to read most of my presentation, the reason being is the time frame and the information that I would like to share. I'd like to make sure that I can stay within the time frame and also share as much information as I can. Um, I've struggled to, to determine how to approach this time and how to speak to a group of basically strangers. I was feeling very vulnerable and inadequate. Her statement changed that, however, as she was speaking of her recovery program and all the people involved, directors and participants, she said, they are a great family. I feel very comfortable with them. Why did that change my thinking? Because I never realized that I have been a member of a large family of addiction recovery whether they are known to me or not. I have belonged to this family my entire life. So now I will speak to you as a family member and share just some thoughts about what my experience has been in the addiction recovery journey. 
May I begin with asking all of you to think for a minute about a conflict. I recognize we're all here because of addiction and that's a large conflict. But if you wanna choose some smaller conflict, keep it in mind as I talk about these tools. My comments for a few minutes will be regarding this book. It's called Difficult Conversations. It's written by three Harvard professors, Douglas Stone, Bruce Patton, and Sheila Heen. I have, this has been the um, book that I've taught at UVU for over um, 11 years. I'd recommend this book to all of you, along with all of our other study and information that we have. Um, however, I'm gonna give you a little that if you are going to read it, you need to be ready to change. One of my students after studying the book exclaimed, I think they read my thoughts. This is really scary. Another one said, I don't like this book because I'm doing everything wrong. Another student said, I'm not going to read the book. I just went through years of abuse and finally divorced after two years of litigation. And I don't wanna find out that I did everything wrong. My response to that student as her professor was, well, what grade would you like in the class? She decided to study the book along with the class and at the end of the semester said, I am so glad I read this book because it confirmed that I did everything right. These tools for tonight, I'd like to call stop, look, and listen. Every person who is involved in a conflict, either with themselves or with others, will experience three conversations. The what happened conversation, the emotional conversation, and the identity conversation. These conversations are where we get stuck. Let me just quickly define these conversations. First, the what happened conversation. Most difficult conversations involve a disagreement. And I think we can all understand this about what has happened or what should happen. Who said what and who did what? Who's right? Who meant what? And who's to blame? The emotional conversation. Every difficult conversation or conflict also asks and answer questions about feelings. And I appreciated uh, Jamie talking about that in, uh, um, not being able to recognize that she was avoiding those feelings. Are my feelings valid, appropriate? Should I acknowledge or deny them, put them on the table or check them at the door? What do I do with the other person's feelings? And what if they are angry or hurt? And the third conversation is the identity conversation. This is the conversation we each tell ourselves about what this situation means to us. We conduct an internal debate or whether this means we are competent or incompetent, a good person or bad, worthy of love or unlovable. May I just take a minute and explain a little bit more about these conversations and what they look and sound like. There are three major reasons we find ourselves stuck in the what happened conversation. One, we argue about who's right and who's wrong. Two, we stop listening to the other side of the story. And three, we entangle intent with impact. Let me share an experience to illustrate how we get stuck in arguing who's right and who's wrong. Here is a difficult conversation that I had with my daughter 15 years ago when she was 20 years old. She had an alcohol problem and was facing a third DUI. Her license had been revoked and she was on probation for her offense. She was continuing to drink and drive. I argued with her daily, just stop drinking. She argued that it was not about the drinking. This argument continued for over one year. I was right in the sense that if she stopped drinking, the problem would be resolved. Was I wrong? No. The imminent problem 
was drinking and driving. And the long-term problem was abstinence from drinking. Well, we argued over and over again. We were like two plumbers looking onto a broken pipe, flooding a basement, arguing, arguing over what caused the pipe to break. The problem was not getting solved. Finally, I decided to stop arguing my position for the long-term solution and to look and look and listen to what my daughter was was and to what my daughter had to say with an intent to understand her position. It was then that we changed the way we were both thinking. In my daughter's mind, the problem was not stopping the drinking, but to stop driving. While she was unprepared at that time to abstain from drinking, there would be no DUI if she wasn't driving. Now we were ready to find a solution for the problem at hand. She needed to get to work every day to support her three children. We came up with a plan that I would drive her to work every day and pick her up. The driving issue was resolved and the drinking long-term was a matter left with her. It is hard for human beings to accept a partial resolution when facing a conflict. We want the problem solved entirely. In addiction recovery, the truth must be understood that the problem may not be resolved entirely and may go much longer than we would like. I often remind myself that the small battles we resolve will eventually win the war. We stop listening to the other side of the story. I have a great experience with this. As a professional mediator in the legal world, I had a post-divorce action for a neighbor across the street. She'd been litigating with her ex-spouse for over two years regarding expenses that he had not paid. She had argued in court multiple times, trying to prove that she was right. At the mediation, she spent over an hour telling me the perfect details and logic of her story. I listened patiently to what she had to say. When she had finished, I complimented her on how articulate she had presented her position. Then I carefully asked this question. Are you ready to hear the other side of the story? She was a little taken back, but reluctantly nodded yes. She then sat uncomfortably listening to the position and reasoning of the other side. She didn't say anything once I finished and I thought for sure she was gonna stand up, accuse me of her common complaint that everyone including the court were on his side and walk out. She looked at me across the table and said, this is the first time in two years that anyone Ask me to look and listen to the other side. Within an hour, we were able to, to settle the issues that had consumed her life for two years. She stopped telling her story. She agreed to look at the other side story and she finally opened her mind to really listen to the other side. For most of us, this is not an easy thing to do. Thus, again, we get stuck in the what happened conversation. Once we stop listening only to our story, we will be able to look at the other story with an attitude of exploring, just exploring what they have to say, including their concerns and interests. This can create an opportunity to gain greater knowledge, information, concerns, and interests. Don't get me wrong, this does not mean, however, that we have to accept, adopt, or even believe everything about their story. It just means we finally listened with an intent to understand and an interest to find some answer to solve the problem at hand. Let me use a recent illustration, meaning the last few days with my daughter. After a very turbulent week in our efforts to work together, with her wrestle with addiction, my husband Fred and I feeling very frustrated with her 
In our efforts to help her, we found a piece of information that is critical to her recovery. Once we stopped assuming that intoxication was the reason we couldn't seem to communicate with her, we found that her struggle was not just the alcohol, but through her efforts with sobriety, she was realizing that her mind was not thinking right. She expressed this to us. And when we finally listened without accusations, we all came to conclude that her mental health was a factor and needed to be addressed as well as the addiction. This one piece of vital information was discovered and welcomed by all of us. We were all stuck because of the third reason we can become entangled in the what happened conversation, which is we entangle intent with impact. Let me just explain that. It's this, it sounds like this. We are hurt, therefore they intended to hurt us. Our assumptions about their intentions are just that, assumptions. To illustrate me this, let me share an instant with my grandson, Stevie. My husband, Fred, is a professional oil artist in his spare time. One day he was working on a, commission, a commissioned painting and had left it for just a moment to take care of other business. My grandson, Stevie, was visiting and while spending time talking and catching up with his mother, Stevie wandered into his grandfather's art studio, unbeknownst to us. When we realized that he was missing, we began looking for him. I called for him and heard my husband respond, he is up here. He just finished my painting. He used every ounce of paint. I was horrified and asked Stevie to come downstairs to the living room where I could discipline him for his destructive behavior. When I was through correcting him, I asked Stevie, why did you do this? He replied, I just wanted to paint like grandpa. His actions seemed destructive when in fact it was to create. I'd like to share a side note regarding this incident. As I was correcting Stevie, he just kept laughing and smiling no matter how stern I was trying to help, how stern I was trying to be. I must admit that was really frustrating because I wasn't communicating with him at all. I finally said to him after several failed attempts, Stevie, why are you smiling? And his response, I just can't help laughing when I see angry faces. That changed everything. I couldn't help but laugh myself. The emotions conversation, the second conversation of the conflict is the emotions. There are three reasons why we get stuck in the emotions conversation. The first is we don't recognize the feelings are often at the heart of the conflict. And we express feelings with judgment and blame. And we do not take ownership of our emotions. Good people have bad feelings. The problem is not that we have feelings, but what to do with what to do with them. To avoid getting stuck in the emotions conversation, we must stop believing all our emotions are saying. We can begin to negotiate them through a myriad of questions. The emotions are real, but they may not represent the truth of what happened. Emotions can be very complex and can inflate the conflict, especially with anger. Some of the questions we can consider asking are, well, what am I angry about? Why am I angry? Are there other circumstances that are contributing to my feelings? Before we can take a pragmatic or problem-solving view of the conflict and the issues, we must first diffuse the emotions. Jeffrey Holland stated, anger, if not restrained, is more injurious than the incident that provoked it. A good way of diffusing the angry emotions is to acknowledge our feelings and take ownership of them, which will require that we do not blame the other person for our anger nor our responses. A good rule in acknowledging, expressing, and taking ownership of our emotions is to say something such as, I feel 
rather than you made me feel. Sharing our feelings can be very uncomfortable and the challenge we have in sharing them with accusations, judgment, and anger. Let me just share one last story about my daughter and I. Our daughter was expressing her feelings the other night, which were feelings of inadequacy, being overwhelmed with the problems she had caused. She had been dealing with alcoholism for 20 years and thinking that in despair that the rubble that she had created can never be overcome. I showed her a picture of Mount Rushmore. I asked her what she saw. Her reply was the heads of men on a mountain. I then asked her to look at the rubble underneath the beautiful monuments. We all face difficult challenges in life. While such challenges are not to be minimized, we nonetheless need to recognize that they often do much to define and shape our character in life. Naturally, we often feel that our trials are the most difficult and we are prone to ask, why me? Looking at the awesome sculptures of Mount Rushmore, it is striking to see the enormous rock debris left from the rock carving. Too often in life, we walk through so much of the rubble and debris that it becomes the focus of our thoughts when we should be looking up at the magnificent creation that was the product of such work. Her, her feelings changed just for a moment. 99% of the conflicts I mediate that do not settle is because the parties are stuck in the emotion conversation and cannot reason nor work towards the resolution. The parties are stuck on how they feel and refused to change those feelings. The last conversation is the identity conversation. Our identity, who we are, what we believe in, and how we view things is at risk when we are in conflict. The first responsibility we have then is to give respect to our own identity and to the identity of the other person. Respect should not be contingent upon whether or not it is warranted. We can disagree. We can con conflict. We can fight. We can argue. We can dislike someone. But we still are required to do so, maintaining a level respect for their identity. We often make the mistake of treating others with less respect because we view their behavior not deserving of respect. Or we justify our disrespect because they were disrespectful to us. A lack of respect is the quickest way to become stuck in the conflict. We may disagree with someone, but they still deserve respectful behavior. One way we can avoid getting stuck in the identity conversation is to turn the conflict into a we, us, instead of you. Just replacing the word you to we will make a huge difference in the potential resolution. We have to solve this problem. We have a problem. What should we do about it? We can find an answer. That alone recognizes each party's identity and places each person on common ground trying to find a solution to the conflict at hand. Every small effort we make in applying these tools will diffuse the conflict. And regardless of whether the outcome is a full resolution, a partial one, or just efforts to work through the conflict with a desire to resolve it, there is success. There can be failed resolution to conflicts, but if we do all that we can to try to contribute towards resolution, we have not failed. Our efforts will not be in vain. Jeffrey Holland stated that when we are meek and courageous to pursue reconciliation with God and with each other, we will receive tranqu tranquility of the soul. We can do this with knowledge, greater skills, and with the help of our God. I will end with a pledge to you as a member of the Recovery Addiction Family 
that I will continue to sharpen the tools and stop, look, and listen as I continue to work in my support to an addiction recovery family member. May we all keep trying. Boy, Carolyn. Carolyn, that, thank you so much. You know, you put a lot of work into that and we so appreciate it. By the way, all this will be, it is being recorded and we will have it on the website soon. So you can go back because there's wow. a lot of things in there that many will want to dissect. Powerful stuff. I love just that last part where he says, we may disagree, uh, but we should always have respect for the other person. And uh, so many times we, we tend to get away from that. And that just, it makes things escalate. I like the what happened conversation, the emotional conversation, the identity conversation. Boy, Carolyn, you Replacing you, you the you with it. we. Mm. We can yes. get through this. I yes. love that. Thank you so much. Well Carolyn. done. Thank you for inviting me. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Okay. Um, uh, our next speaker is uh, our own son, Preston Dixon, who is a COO of the Renaissance Ranch. Um, you know, you guys, when we were in the throes of our family addiction, when both uh, of our boys were in the middle of their addiction and things were really spiraling down, it was Preston that made the choice to go in and stay in recovery. Um, I believe that very well could have saved his life and it probably very well saved his brother's. And so we're indebted. We've talked a lot about that. Uh, Preston now is passionate about recovery. He does uh, work with the men at the ranch. Just the other day, we had uh, one of our uh, brothers as we were doing a mission, uh, a meeting came up and says, man, I can't tell you. I was just crying when Preston got through teaching us and working us how to meditate. And, and uh, you know, Preston is, is very talented in many areas, technically, but also in recovery. And uh, he's going to share a little bit of his story and a new app that he's put together as well. So uh, uh, Press, if you want to unmute and let's turn the time over to our oldest son, uh, Preston Dixon. All Thanks, right. Jeff. Hey, so first off, who's going to make the, uh, the call sound when I go over time? A little caca, caca. <laughs> I'll well, probably you mute know. that. <laughs> Hey, uh, I've loved this webinar, this webinar so far. Um, you know what, Steve, your story, a lot of your story was very similar to mine. I was listening to your story and it's, it's, uh, you know, it's the stories to me that always take me back and remind me, you know, how it, the insanity was when I was in my addiction. And, you know, sometimes, um, in recovery, we move on and after a period of time, it's interesting how that little, that disease never goes away. How, uh, at least for me, a lot of times it's, you know, sometimes my first thought is, is, you know, I, I could, I know how to change the way I feel today. I, if I, if I, if I really needed to, I can alter my state of mind. Um, when times get tough when we're triggered and we're stressed, it never goes away. Um, although the, um, quotient of that emotion is dramatically reduced over time. Um, you know, it's interesting when, when I was in my disease, listening to your story, how you were lying to your wife, um, how you're out trying to find pills. I, I did the exact same thing. Yeah, I got married when I was 19, by the way, if you ever have a chance to do that, go ahead and pass on that. It's a bad idea, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I remember just being out of my mind and, and constantly having that anxiety in my chest and, the, the interesting thing is I didn't know I had a disease at the time. Like most guys, when they come into the ranch, you know, for their first time um, in treatment, a lot of guys think they can kind of do this thing on their own and they, they don't, they just need to stop using and they think the drugs or the alcohol is a problem or it's a solution to a greater problem. But most, most interestingly enough is they don't know what that greater problem is. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, with the disease of addiction from a, from a biological standpoint, it, how it hijacks the brain, um, it's still baffling to me how, how when we're in that state of mind or in that state of being, how we're not thinking clearly, how it feels like 
I remember when I was in my addiction, this is something to kind of paint a picture for, for maybe some of the family members who don't, don't understand it. Um, because I've talked to a lot of family members that they come up and, you know, after a meeting, after a, maybe a fifth Sunday or um, a, a fireside, and they say, why, why won't my son just stop? I don't understand. Why is he doing this? Why is he doing this? And to kind of paint a picture where, where a lot of times um, as addicts where we get is our brain is screaming nothing. It's like water torture. It, the best way I could put it is when I was addicted to opiates, um, it's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever been cliff jumping and you're 20 or 30 feet high and you jump off and your adrenaline's going and all of a sudden you find yourself maybe 10 or 15 feet underwater and you're thinking, oh my gosh, I need air. And that's the only thing on your mind. You're not thinking about what's for dinner tonight. Uh, if you maybe have lost your swimsuit jumping in, the only thing you're thinking of, I need to get up and I need air and I need, I need it now. And that's kind of um, where I was at in my addiction, where kind of like water torture, every other thought was I need to get pills or I need, I need a drink. Um, because I was that, that, that had become my coping, my coping mechanism to, to treat some deeper, deeper seated issues that I, that I had and, and many of which um, I didn't know I had. And so the topic that I kind of wanted to talk to, to today about was uh, culture and more and community and kind of how that how that um, is critical to helping helping um, you know as family members heal uh, if we have loved ones or if we're uh, struggling with addiction or in recovery or even been in recovery for a long time how how that's so critical to be a part of a community that um, everyone can kind of you know, heal and work through together and, and be there for support. Um, Jamie, I liked your comment when you said, you know, when, when one person's heart began to heal, that everybody else's heart in the family's heart began to heal. And, and um, I remember in, in treatment, when we started going through family groups, and I started working through some of those issues with, with, with our family and started identifying really what some of those core issues were and started talking about it how, you know, I just remember, remember after those, those meetings, just getting honest uh, and vulnerable with my family, how my heart began to heal. And so, you know, to echo Steve, there's, there's great hope, great hope in recovery. Um, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to play a video to kind of illustrate, to kind of illustrate um, the importance of having uh, support and kind of maybe kind of relate that to, to my story a little bit, but let me share my screen real quick and jump into uh, it's actually in the app this is kind of what the app looks like so I threw it in here for for some of our guys but all right so I remember the first time I saw that I it was it was in the morning I, I got kind of emotional because I, I related I related that um, um, <clears throat> I related that story to my, my early, uh, recovery. And, um, you know, I, I know that, uh, a lot of guys when they first get into recovery were just like how I was just, just scared, didn't know what to do. Um, couldn't, couldn't control what was going on in our, in our heads, trying to figure out why we're, <clears throat> why we're lying to everybody, why we're lying to ourselves. Um, trying to, trying to not look in the mirror because we didn't like or trust that guy anymore and, and just feeling alone. And, you know, looking back, um, those feelings there were, were kind of the, the thing that um, the drugs and the alcohol were, were the solution for. Um, you know, I, I asked the guys uh, frequently at the ranch um, to kind of help identify what some of those core issues are, I'll, I'll ask the guys, because I, I know what they are, but most of the guys don't when they come in. And uh, so I asked the guys to get a little vulnerable with, with each other and let's be real and kind of have that kind of talk. And then I'll ask them, you know, how many of you guys feel like, uh, you know, one of those emotions that we're feeling very frequently in our disease um, or in our addiction, how many of us just, just maybe not quite feel, feel good enough? And uh, without fail, every hand goes up, just about every hand. Um, and then I'll ask, you know, how many, how many of you guys feel like you just don't, don't measure up? Um, every hand goes up. 
Uh, how many of you guys just a lot of times just feel unworthy, have those feelings of just, just not being worthy of maybe God's love, your family's love, hands go up. And um, <clears throat> my point with that is this disease of addiction is, is uh, it's a counterfeit for, for God's love. Uh, it's a counterfeit for feeling good enough. Um, when I used drugs and alcohol, I felt good enough. Um, and I didn't understand from a biological standpoint that in a neurological standpoint and a neurochemical standpoint, what was happening in my brain, how the blood flow is actually going from the part of my brain that processed those emotions into the midbrain uh, and vice versa. I didn't know how things were getting manipulated to make me feel different. I just knew that I felt better. And then my brain was, was deceived. And after a time, a period of time, like Steve, Steve said, you know, just, he just used just to feel normal. Cause if he didn't use, uh, he was sick. And so I can relate with that. And, and uh, anyone who's at the ranch right now can relate with that. Um, and so the thing, the, the thing that I wanted to really drive home today was on both sides, whether you're an addict or a family member and have uh, having a loved one struggle either or uh, what, what I've seen that has helped me and my family is I've seen as we've gotten involved in the culture of recovery, that hearts can begin to heal. Um, <clears throat> I went on a, we, uh, after the, this last summer, I want to tell a quick story here. We did a, uh, a Spartan race uh, in the Utah uh, Nebo, uh, Mount Nebo in, in Ogden. Um, uh, we did a camp out slash Spartan race. And so we invited all, a bunch of the alumni out and had a big alumni event. And so we had uh, some of our strongest alumni up there and, uh, you know, to come out to strongest emotionally and in recovery, not just strongest, but some strong dudes too, for sure. But uh, come out and do a Spartan race and a camping, uh, camping trip. Um, kind of a side note, if, if you ever want to do a Spartan race in Utah, go ahead and pass on that as well. <laughs> It's a ski resort, turns out, and it's just up and down, up and down, and your knees, your knees cannot hang. But uh, uh, what happened is we had a, a, a powwow around the campfire, and I asked the guys, hey, what can we do to improve? We like to think we're, you know, the best company in the world, and we have the best people here, and, you know, we do a great job, but what can we improve? And the, uh, you know, what was, what was shared is we can do a lot better on having, you um, some way to connect all of the uh, alumni a little bit better. A lot of guys feel like when they go from residential to outpatient, there's a huge drop off in care. It's because it is. They're going from a residential structured environment where they have their whole day planned <laughs> to, um, you know, having, you know, hopefully a good plan of attack and, you know, but it's just a huge drop, of, drop in care. And so what we did is we created, a, we created an app. Uh, it's just called the Renaissance Ranch app and, and we got it launched recently. But uh, I know my time's up. That went really fast, but I'll show you guys. This, we, we just launched this, and uh, we've got a family member section in here as well. But if you download the app, you'll, uh, you'll click Request Access right here. And there's, I think, five or six questions. You'll just say you're a family member, and then we'll get an email. We'll add you on here in the app as a family member. But this is kind of a, a place where you can have your own kind of culture, uh, old say like your own community where you can connect on as well as good resources you would just swipe right uh once and then you, just, you have the family program here um and then we've got links to all the different types of classes we've got all the webinars on here past webinars we have the family program events calendar on here we'll have the future um webinars and things coming up and then the, we have a utah family private group wall here so anyone who uh, wants to just reach out or have questions or to give hope or that kind of thing, that's what this is for. This is one for Idaho here. Uh, we have a family program workshop material in here. We've got the family addiction recovery podcast here. And uh, we've even have links to Al 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 Al-Anon meetings here and uh, also to al team meetings as well in here as well. So <clears throat> anyway, I, I uh, just wanted to say thank you to the other speakers. I, I got a lot, a lot of what you guys said. I feel like I mostly rambled. I went way off script here today, but sure love you guys and and uh, <laughs> talk to you later.
Thank you, Preston. Sure appreciate it. Thank you so um, much, Preston. And thanks for all the work you've done on that recovery app. That's going to be so cool to be connected. You know, uh, th that app is something where uh, not just for family members, the main thing is for the uh, community of recovering addicts with the ranch, that they'll be able to have that community uh, to ward off, you know, all the uh, bad influences, the the hyenas, sort of speak. I love that lion video and, too. Uh, when we get together with one mm -hmm. other person, the strength that we have and the synergy is so important for us to mm -hmm. to be safe with from mm -hmm. all of these problems with addiction in our family systems. So, so again, you. thanks, Chris. Hey, let's uh, bring on our next speaker, Matt Piper. You know, you know when you're doing good in recovery, be, the better your recovery is, the better your beard looks. No question <laughs> about that. Hey, you guys, Matt has been with the ranch for about six years now. Um, he is an advanced substance abuse counselor. He works every day with the men in the Utah Bluffdale uh, facility. He's one of the funniest guys I know. But <laughs> no you guys, pressure, Matt. <laughs> um, he's got a, a tough uh, story of, of recovery. Uh, he's not only a, 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 a counselor, but he is a recovering addict and an alumni from the ranch. So he brings much to the table and has done great things and will continue to do great things. So let's turn some time over to Matt. Matt, you're on brother. But Thank you, you, Matt. There you go. All right, you got it. Thank you guys. Thank you everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys tonight. And and Preston, I was about to make the, uh, the bird noises for the timer, but uh, so if you could do that for me, that would be great. I got uh, it. So just a quick funny story about that. So I was at a meeting in Idaho and uh, they asked me to share because I was a, an outsider. So I was sharing and the lady next to me, this sound of this motorcycle kept going off. And I would look over. I'm like, that's kind of rude in the middle of a meeting. And she would stop it. And then I was rambling on again. And then about five minutes later, this the sound of this motorcycle goes off again. I look over. I'm like, what is the deal with that? So I keep sharing. And then finally, the third time it goes off, I realized that that's that meeting's timer. And once you hear the motorcycle, you're supposed to top, stop talking. So to my horror, I, I just kept on going. So I'll listen for that or the motorcycle sound. So um, as always, it's again, it's grateful. I'm grateful to be here tonight with you guys. My name is uh, Matt Piper. I'm a recovering alcoholic, a recovering addict, a recovering perfectionist, a recovering codependent. And what I really suffer from is the disease of shame in which there's no cure but it can be put remission based on me staying in fit spiritual condition and the daily maintenance of my 12 step program. And so when I share at these webinars, I, I was thinking of what would I, you know, given 10, 15 minutes to share with to new family members, if I could only share one thing. So I put together a little PowerPoint, but before I do that, I'm a big fan of bibliotherapy and, uh, and it's been shared here tonight and, and everyone's kind of talked about it and, Family members will ask me, you know, what's the best thing I can do to help my loved one? And it's always work on yourself. Uh, work the 12 steps, you know, find an Al-Anon meeting or find a meeting that works for you. Uh, do some bibliotherapy, some reading, things like that. Educate yourself on the disease of addiction and then what you can do for yourself. And so, as always, the, the original big book of Alcoholics Anonymous is a great one. In fact, if you're a family member, you can change the word from drinking and put thinking. Has your thinking ever got you in trouble? Has your thinking ever caused problems? So that's a great one. And then, as always, and, and Jamie also mentioned this tonight, too, as well, uh, the book Codependent No More by Melody Beatty. And so this is a great beginner for uh, understanding codependency and what my role is uh, in addiction and what I can do differently uh, with a loved one. And the crazy thing is at, at the heart, all addicts, alcoholics are really codependents at heart. And once they get the drinking out of their system, they realize it's about relationships, right? And so um, um, the number one cause of relapse is negative emotion and relationship conflict. And so codependent no more, I'll actually have some of the guys uh, do some assignments out of this book because it's so helpful uh, for them as well. And then the Al-Anon way to do the steps is Pass to Recovery. So this is a fantastic book. And my wife's been in Al-Anon for oh, 19 years now. And so she's worked the steps out of this book. And then the other book I really love for family members, and I'm not getting any kickbacks for any of these books tonight, by the way, uh, is this one, How Al-Anon Works for Friends and Family of Alcoholics. So again, these are some great starter material for you to sort of familiarize yourself with, with addiction and uh, what you can do uh, about it. So I am going to try to share my screen here with you and hopefully I don't accidentally 
click on the wrong button and order a pizza from Amazon. Let's see here. Uh, share. Okay, I think I got it. All right. So again, as we talked about tonight, um, you know, our topic is what to do when you don't know what to do, or I like to call it defense against the dark arts, which is a, a rip off of Harry Potter. So uh, first thing I would like to convey to you guys is to and understand on page 64 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it states that our liquor was but a symptom, but now we must get down to causes and conditions. And so when you break that down, the cause is typically uh, shame-based issues, uh, feeling unworthy of love and belonging, uh, things like that. And the condition is typically the codependency. And I'll get into that. So if I were to do an autopsy on addiction and laid it on the table and we cut down underneath the first layer, we would find codependency. Again, that fear of not belonging or, or a feeling of love and belonging. Then underneath that, we get down to those shame-based beliefs, those core beliefs that I'm unworthy of love and belonging. And that just drives the addiction. Now you'll find that um, the addictions really, if it's alcohol, if it's uh, drugs, it really doesn't matter. It's all driven by these same causes and conditions, right? And so um, the one thing to keep in mind is that all addictions um, are both behavioral and chemical are maladaptive coping mechanisms designed to meet needs. And so what that means is all behavior, good or bad, is designed to meet needs. And so addicts, alcoholics are trying to get a certain need met or they're feeling defective in some area of their life or a void in some area of their life. And so they turn to these maladaptive coping skills to deal with life. And so the hope with treatment and uh, AA and recovery and things like that is to teach them adaptive ways to cope with life rather than the maladaptive cope with life. And so when we talk about uh, needs, um, so this was my intimacy poster. I've got a better handout. I couldn't get on here on time tonight, but one of our family members put together a fantastic handout for me. So this is a picture of the poster that I use and, and uh, it has to deal with intimacy. And so when we talk about what our needs are, so the number one craving for all of us as humans, the number one need and the number one fear is to have a, an intimate relationship with another human being. And when I say intimate, um, that doesn't mean sexual intimacy. That's only one of the six parts of intimacy. This intimacy means just a real connection with another human being. In fact, we're hardwired for that from birth um, to be connected to somebody else, right? As, as babies, we connect to our mothers for survival. So we're sort of hardwired to connect with other people. And sometimes that can turn into codependency. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. So when I talk about needs, um, everybody, in fact, when I speak, it doesn't really matter where it's at. Sometimes at you know, like a, a state conference or, or just whatever meeting, I'll kind of do a, a survey in a group of addicts and non-addicts, alcoholics. And I'll say, raise your hand, or maybe you can do this in your mind if you need one or all five of these emotional needs. So the need for affection, attention, appreciation, approval, or acceptance. And think about if that's one of the one of the five things or maybe all five of the things that you need. In fact, number five there, this need for acceptance is so powerful in humans. This is where you see how um, gangs work, where they sort of uh, acceptance is seen as love. Right. And so people begin to do things they would not normally do because they want to feel accepted or belong to a certain group or even in history. You know, you look at like the Nazi party and things like that using acceptance as you want to be like us, you want to be in our group. And so uh, that need is very, very strong in humans. And so we want these five things, right? We have these needs that we need to get met. And the opposite is what we're trying to avoid are these emotional fears. And again, in your mind, maybe raise your hand and, and say to yourself, if you fear one or all five of these things. So do you fear criticism, ridicule, judgment, rejection, or abandonment? So think about that if you fear one or all five of those things. And so as humans, again, this um, our craving, our need, and our fear is this connection with another human being. Now, the scary thing is it requires emotional honesty, right? And emotional honesty is a scary place to be because it requires vulnerability and to be vulnerable, which means we have to take risks, right? And so when I'm being emotionally honest with you, I'm, I'm telling you what I'm feeling and it's opening to the door to my feelings and my emotions, but that's a scary place to be, right? Because I'm afraid if I tell you how I'm really feeling, if I'm emotionally honest, 
I'm going to get one of those five uh, fears, right? One of the, I'm going to get criticized, I'm going to be ridiculed, I'm going to be judged, rejected, or abandoned. In fact, uh, when I do step ones with the guys, and I've done probably, oh my gosh, dozens and dozens of step ones, which is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and our life has become unmanageable. There's a part on the question that they fill out that says, uh, what feelings are you trying to avoid by using chemicals, either drugs or alcohol? And it's always the top three. It's anxiety, depression, uh, sadness, or four, I guess, and fear, right? So, and, and this has been on every single one that I've ever seen over the last couple of years. I've been doing this for a couple of years. It's always the same with those three or top four, which fall into this emotional fear category, this one, two, three, four, and five over there. That's how deep and powerful those fears are now, what happens with the addict alcoholic is they begin to use to numb that stuff out, right? So now they're not feeling a connection to you or feeling a connection to anything because they're not feeling ridiculed, judged, abandoned, rejected, or abandoned because of the use of substances. They've numbed that out, right? So they're numbing those feelings and emotions. And so I tell family members um, who are trying to connect with a loved one in active addiction. And, and again, you don't have to have the same life experiences to know what I'm feeling or what I'm going through. And what I mean by that is we heal relationships or we heal in context of relationships. And we're, we're built to deal with feelings and emotions in concert with other human beings, to, to talk about how we're feeling and to, to get that feedback and to connect with one another. But that is a scary place to be because um, the possibility of one or, or all five of these fears taking place. And so, um, so an example would be if my sister called me and she told me she was in an abusive relationship and I said to her, oh, come on, Sarah, you know better than that. You were raised different. I can't believe you're putting up with that. I'm giving her one of those five fears. So I'm going to be seen as a not a safe person to share with, right? Now, if I go over here and I realize that she really wants one of these five things and I can say to her, Man, thank you for sharing with me. I'm sorry that you're going through that. What can I do to help you? So I'm giving her these emotional needs and I'm connecting now. Though I've never been a woman or in an abusive relationship like that, I know what those five fears feel like and that's what she's experiencing. So as I lean into that, I can feel what she's going through and lean into these emotional needs. And that's the same if your loved one's uh, suffering from uh, addiction really of any kind. What's underneath that is these five fears and what I'm looking for are these five needs. And again, that's where some of the empathy and compassion can come in um, as we're dealing with our loved ones, particularly when they're in active addiction, uh, trying to get these needs met. So uh, the three C's of Alan, and I love this. And again, this is one, uh, you know, you can write down a mantra, uh, particularly for family members, because they feel like that they're responsible. So the three C's is I didn't cause it. I can't control it. I can't cure it. But there's a fourth C that I love, but how am I contributing to it? So again, the addiction is not your fault. Lord knows you've probably tried to control it or to help them and unable to do that and trying to cure it. Can't do that either, right? You can't do any of those three C's. But as you look at how did I contribute to it now, have I been contributing in a positive or a negative way? And that's what we'll look in tonight. And typically, um, unfortunately, there's no manual that comes out when your loved one's in addiction where you... You know, you get a book and you're like, okay, this is how we do it, right? So it's trial by error. So oftentimes, you know, we, we think we're helping when we're really contributing in a negative way, but we don't know that we are until we know that we are, right? So when I'm talking about negative contributions, I'm talking about doing things of trying to control it. And keep in mind that you can't love and control somebody at the same time. It's either one or the other. So as I try to, you know, and Jamie shared about this a little bit, and if Holly was on, my wife would share about that, trying to save people from consequences, um, trying to take care of things for people, trying to um, control things. And really what it's happening is just enabling the addiction. It's getting worse and worse and worse, right? So negative contribution is trying to control. Another one is having no boundaries. And addicts and alcoholics, by their very nature, are boundless because they would stop when they know that they should, right? So they cross boundaries. And there's this enmeshment sometimes in these codependent relationships where I don't know where you end and I begin and we're sort of entangled, right? So the hope would be to, and in nature we see this, where these symbiotic relationships where 
two organisms are mutually benefiting each other. And you see this in the, in the wild, right? You'll see the water buffalo, and then you see the crane on the water buffalo's back. The crane sits on his back because he protects him from predators. The water buffalo lets him sit there because he picks off bugs. They're mutually benefiting each other, so they're helping each other. But in a parasitic relationship, they're just sucking the life out of each other. And it's kind of a miserable existence. And you'll know, you know, you've been through addiction with family members or, or loved ones, what that looks like, that enmeshment, right? And so boundaries can help us with that enmeshment to separate those things. Um, what are my enabling behaviors? Again, am I paying for stuff or, or how am I enabling the addiction? Um, and again, I worked in admissions for a long time and we found when people would stop enabling and draw boundaries with their loved ones, they actually would get better. Right. So when people get dropped off to treatment, I always tell family members to tell your loved ones, hey, I'm not going to pick you up. Um, if you decide you want to leave treatment, then you can't you know, stay with me. This is my boundary. I don't want to enable it anymore. And then another telltale sign, if I'm being codependent, is am I caretaking versus caregiving? So caretaking is more the codependent nature. Caregiving is I'm helping you when I can and when I want to. Right. So Brene Brown talks about the acronym BIG. So what boundaries can I set that I can I keep my integrity, that I can G be the most generous person to you? So again, remember caretaking is doing something for others that they can do for themselves. Caregiving is helping people with stuff. So kind of distinguishing between the two, am I taking care of the person or am I caregiving? And so, um, all right, let me get into some positive contributions. So using the power of empathy, what I talked about a little bit earlier is leaning into that, those emotional fears and, uh, Again, sympathy is feeling bad for somebody. Empathy is feeling with somebody. So if I know what those feelings feel like and I lean into that how I feel, I can have the empathetic response, which is also the antidote to shame. So um, another positive contribution, I can set healthy boundaries and limits. I can stop enabling. Another big one here, which is, again, when there's a lot of shame and addiction, is I can communicate acceptance when behavior is lacking. So if I have to talk to you about hard things, your worth as a human being isn't on the table. I love you, therefore we need to discuss behavior over here. So again, it's being able to communicate that love when behavior is lacking. So that doesn't mean you never talk about anything hard. It's like, no, I love you, and now we need to talk about what's going on over here and setting those boundaries. And then, uh, and Alan on, they talk about this drop the rope, which is um, when your loved one is in active addiction and they pick up the rope and they want you to get into a tug of war with them, and we tug back and forth and, you know, we're doing this, this dance of tugging the rope. And Al-Anon says, just drop the rope, refuse to participate or take the bait and keep into this in this boundary war with them. So those are just some tips. And then I want to end with um, keeping in mind the universal need for all of us as humans to know that I am of worth, that my feelings matter and that somebody cares about me. In fact, when someone is sharing with us, this, I try to keep these three things in mind. Like I need to communicate their worth, their feelings matter, and I care about them. And that builds that relationship of empathy so that we can begin to build that, that close intimate relationship that we need. So, and lastly, real quick, I just wanted to show uh, this for a little bit of hope. So this is the, a picture of the place that I last drank on April 15th, uh, 2013 in this spot here. And so this spot is very sacred to me. It's kind of like uh, my burning bush moment or sacred grove or however you, however you understand that to be where uh, I didn't see it then that night that I drank, but praying for help and, and praying that this would come to an end. And this was at my darkest moment. So again, meeting my higher power wasn't, you know, in a church or a temple or, or I wasn't doing really, really awesome. You know, when I met my higher power, it was at my lowest point when I thought I couldn't go on any longer. Uh, meeting him here in this spot and thankfully things got better from that day forth just to give you a little bit of hope if you're if you're in this right now and feel like you you know there's no future just don't give up before the miracle happens and stick with it and i promise you you can get better we do recover from the disease of alcoholism and addiction and family members can recover as well so thank you guys i think that's my time and i will uh stop sharing my screen here and stop share okay there we go Good thank deal. you matt Thanks, thank matt. you so much you know you guys you can see the power of matt in uh what he has learned i mean he he has lived addiction and he is living recovery and it's making a difference you can see uh he understands completely 
the shame-based condition of addiction. And uh, you can imagine in working with the addicts how uh, he helps them understand they're not bad people that needed to quit be, doing bad things. They're just sick people needing some healing. So uh, powerful stuff, Matt. Matt. I've been teaching our family education group for how many years now? You and Holly were several oh my years. God, probably like five years. Yes, you can it's see. Crazy. What a beautiful job. Thank you so much oh, for talking about codependency nice. and shame. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Matt. Appreciate it. That. Okay, our last speaker. I am so excited to hear from Justin McCoy. He is the executive director for the Renaissance Ranch in Idaho. What's neat about, um, about Justin is he is an alumni from the ranch as well. He's been through it. His, his darkest days now are his greatest assets to help his brothers. He's got a heart of gold. He's sensitive, but he's got major capacity. The Lord's given him great gifts to help his brothers in recovery. And so he's got a special gripping story. So we're going to turn some time over to Justin. Keep in mind, those of you who have questions, we're going to do question and answers. Feel free to put them in the chat and we'll get to them here right after Justin is finished. So with that, Justin, uh, you're on, brother. Thank you, Justin. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. So I'm going to set my timer because I don't have anybody doing the bird call for me over here. So, um, you know, I, I just want to say like the webinar tonight has been extremely helpful for me and you know at times in our life and in our our recovery we tend to forget things and you know when you can take us a moment to stop and really listen and be reminded of those things that are important to you um, and what really matter emotionally and spiritually um, some of the stuff we've talked about tonight it's it's really good and it's really helpful so um, I, as Rick said, I, I've got a long, a long life of addiction. I spent probably 15 years, uh, in active addiction and, you know, I'm pretty young. So that means I started using when I was 13 years old and, uh, my life, my childhood was probably the complete opposite of some of the other. I had a complete disarray of a, of a family life. I, didn't have supportive parents. I didn't have, you know, um, what I felt was a loving family, you know, at that time. And from early childhood, I never really felt um, important or, or loved or that I could ever offer love to anybody. And so, you know, when I think about my life and what I, what it was like, um, I always wanted to be like that person, you know, I always wanted to be like that other individual and I was never quite comfortable in my own skin. And that was something that took me many years to come to terms with. Um, uh, like, like Preston, I married at a young age too. So I, I did try that didn't work out, um, too well for me, but I learned a lot, you know, and I have wonderful kids that, you know, love me now and, and, uh, you know, have taught me many blessings and I'll, I'll continue to help them throughout their lives. And, and so my, my teenage years, my adult life was filled with, with drugs and alcohol, um, crime and, and many stays in the correctional system. And it was pretty rough. And, you know, I, I never really felt like that there was meaning in life or a purpose and I was just kind of floating through life thinking, you know, uh, from a victim standpoint of, you know, what was me when, when is something going to happen to me? That's of value. You know, when am I going to find that, that special job? When am I going to make that million dollars? Uh, or when am I going to find, you know, a, a true friendship? And um, those, those things came except the million dollars, but you know, that's, that's okay, because money's not the most important things in, in life. So um, <clears throat> I, I'm what you call a chronic relapser, you know, my, my recovery journey um, started a long time ago, and I relapsed over and over and over again, I had reached a point where I was just sick and tired 
of being sick and tired. And that was just one step of a process for me. I have probably been to eight different treatment centers um, over those over those years. I started working in recovery um, and got about three years in and had relapsed again. And that was when I had met, you know, Preston and the guys over at the ranch. And one of the things that I learned in the ranch was was accountability and honesty, um, you know, true, true emotional honesty. And that was something that I spent many years lying to myself about. Um, and it took me a while to, you know, understand what that really meant. And, you know, I, I have a, a few couple pivotal moments in my recovery that I, that truly really stand out to me. Um, and, you know, Steve talked about it and it's been mentioned a few times. Uh, it was, you know, if, if drugs were really my problem or my solution, you know, and they were my solution for many years. And I thought that they were my problem. And it wasn't until I realized that they were my solution that I could actually do something about it and figure out how do I fill that, you know, that hole with something else. And for me, it was my spirituality and it was connection with others. Um, another, another defining moment for me was when I, when I realized that my, my conception of God, um, was not helpful to me. I, I grew up thinking that God didn't love me because of the stuff that I had, you know, done wrong because of the behaviors that I had chose because of the life that I lived. Um, I did a lot of hurtful things to people and I was extremely remorseful for it. Um, family had shamed me throughout for those things. And I thought that I was completely unforgivable and unlovable. And when I came to my own understanding of my higher power of my creator, and I realized that, you know, there was nothing really that I could do that or had done that he would stop loving me for, that was when the true healing had happened, you know, and I've, I've got family that I've been able to reconnect with that have been extremely helpful to my recovery. And I have family that, that I just, you know, have to stay away from, you know, they, they talk about the boundaries in the family program and, and it's not because that, you know, either they're unhealthy or I'm unhealthy, but it's because, we just don't mesh good together, you know, and that's okay because we, we have an understanding now that we can love each other. Um, but yet we realize that, you know, if we spend too much time together, yeah, we, we probably will get at each other and that's okay. Um, but the, the program that I choose to live now is one of, of love and forgiveness. Um, you know, I, I started working in recovery after taking a break for a few years because I wasn't healthy. And, you know, and somebody had told me you're you're going to hurt someone, you know, working in recovery when you're not healthy enough to be working in recovery. And it really, you know, hit me deep down because I felt the truth in it at that time. And, you know, so I I took a few years to work on myself. And when I started working in recovery again, I was. I was ignited by that passion, um, you know, that, that empathy to really help others. And it's probably one of the things that I enjoy doing most in life besides spending time with my family is, is working in recovery. And one of the hardest things that I have to do is realize that I can't, I can't change others. You know, I can't, I can't help and save them as Matt talked about. Um, but I can be here for them when they're ready. And so, you know, hanging around uh, in their lives, as Matt says, until the miracle happens, um, I, I hope I can always be there uh, for guys when that miracle does happen. But, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't always, uh, you know, become a reality. But there's, there's definitely hope in the 12 step process. Like I, I, I look back and I think if I could recover um, after everything that I've been through, then, then that guy can recover because I, I didn't feel that there was anybody worse than me, if that makes sense. Um, 
I don't feel that way anymore. But that's how I felt, you know, was that I was the bottom of the barrel. I was the worst of the worst. And, you know, there was no hope for me. And if God could take and mold me into what he has today, um, that's a pretty big accomplishment. So if I can do it, you know, other people can do it too. So um, that's really all that I have to share with you guys tonight. And I'm extremely grateful to, to be here. And I, I think that, you know, there's definitely a lot uh, that's been said here. And I, I hope to listen through the recording again and, you know, pick those things out. So thank you. Justin, Thanks, Justin, thank you so much, brother. Thank you. Man, that's that's a gripping thank story. Thank you for your recovery you know. example. Um, it's one thing to have a person fall in addiction where they they've come from a family where the parents are solid and love them. It's a whole different ball game when that love's not there. And so, um, man, we're going to come back to that here in a moment. Thank you, uh, yeah. Justin. Okay, you guys got a couple of questions. Um, uh, and, and as you want, as, as listeners to continue to add questions, go ahead and do that. We'll go for a bit here before we have to close it down. I, I want to go back for a second to, um, uh, to, to Steve and, Je and Jamie's story. You guys, here's a story that, that uh, really has hope and healing. It's a story of a wife emotionally bankrupt in the corner in the fetal position for years trying to figure this out. Um, Steve, what was interesting is you said this, you said, when I got the separation papers, it was a complete checkup from the neck up. Now you didn't say that, but that's what I kind of heard. And I've been thinking about that because it's so critical for us as family members, uh, to not be so good codependent that we're enabling the addiction, trying to think, help think that we're helping them. Rather, it's, it's a critical that we have boundaries, not against or to the addict, but rather boundaries that just keep us feeling safe as a family member. But yet we understand that what happens is boundaries help create consequences. And unless the pain of the consequence is greater than the pain of recovery, a person in addiction won't take it seriously. Could you maybe shed some light on that, um, Steve, as far as when you got that sep those separation papers, the boundaries, that, what it did for you, and maybe you can um, slide in some color as well on that, Jamie, too. So I actually think um, probably the first time, because interestingly enough, uh, that boundary was set but not kept um, by Jamie. <laughs> Um, I, I don't think she had the tools uh, yet, but I think to when I was um, in, in, in house, so inpatient there at Renaissance Ranch, and I, I'd been there like 10 days or something, and I was ready to come home. I was healed. I hadn't taken drugs for 10 days. Basically, everything was back to normal in my mind. And I called Jamie um, and I said to her, I said, hey, I'm ready to come home. I, I'm done with this place. I've basically gotten everything. Um, that I, that I can get out of this place. So I'm ready to leave. And she, she said to me, and I'll never forget this. She said, well, that's fine. You can leave, but where are you going to go? And, and I said, well, home, of course, you know, my, my home, that's where I'm going to go. And she said, well, you can leave, but you can't come here. And in that moment, um, that was one of the first times where she set a hard boundary for me that really was a wake up call of, Hey, she's not messing around anymore. And all of a sudden, uh, Renaissance Ranch looked a whole lot better than uh, Bus Station. So that, that to me was a, a huge wake up call. And she's continued to set boundaries with me um, throughout the last. So we've got uh, almost four years. But that was the first time I remember where one of those boundaries she set. And I, I don't I, you know, I know now that I'm not uh, very unique in wanting to leave treatment after about a week. But when she sent set that boundary and I remember what she just said that is like, well, you can leave. But. Um, where are you going to go? Because you can't come here. And uh, I think she kind of, you know, they were in the middle of something with that. And it took everything in her to say that. But at the time, I was just thinking how mean she was. Um, but it was exactly what I needed to hear. And if she would have held, wouldn't have held that boundary, 
if she would have taken me back home because of, she bought into this sob story, there's no question in my mind that um, we wouldn't be where we're at today. Hmm. Wow. And, and to what he said the first time when I set that boundary, hmm. doing separation papers, it was my, I didn't have a sponsor. I didn't have recovery. I, you know, um, Matt's wife was able to get into Al-Anon long before he got into treatment, but mine came afterwards. So I had no support. No, I had a therapist who was an addiction therapist. So I think having, having the ranch and the family group and having sponsors or Al-Anon is the most helpful, beneficial thing because I didn't know how to uphold a boundary. So yeah, I said, I, I gave him a boundary and a timeline. And if you didn't meet it, then, you know, you needed to, you know, go into treatment or something needed to happen. And that day came and went and we went to my therapist. He's like, well, what'd you do? I'm like, well, he's still living at home. So <laughs> I just, I didn't know how to uphold the boundaries. So that's just like the stark contrast of, of having these tools and resources and not having them and being clueless and not knowing what to do or who to turn to. And just so you know, I love ones that are in treatment. Um, they're, they're learning how to set boundaries as well with us as family members. If we have alcohol or substances in our home, they're being taught that they need to, when they come out of, out of the treatment center, they've got to find a safe place for them uh, because they have, they're just like coming out of the hospital with the brain disease. They've got to create a really safe environment. And so don't be surprised if your loved ones have need to set boundaries with the family members too, because they need to be safe as well. So I mean, it kind of goes okay. both ways. You know, you guys, um, um, what's really interesting here is this idea of boundaries. When the family member becomes healthy, that helps lift the kite. In other words, a kite cannot fly unless it has wind blowing against it. A relationship doesn't work unless there's boundaries, there's trust, etc. So, that's why the best thing we can do for a loving addict is work on our own recovery. Or work on so, ourselves. So mm -hmm. the kite and the wind, you know, fly together. Uh, Matt, can you give us a little bit more commentary on that uh, as a clinical side of things? Yeah. So again, and, uh, and, and it's kind of been shared here tonight as well. So again, it's like, you know, when you get on the, when you're on the airplane, right? So the pre-flight announcement, it's always, you know, in the rare case of the loss of cabin pressure, which already scares you, but it says the mask will drop from the top, right? To affix your own mask first before fixing other people's masks. Now the great codependent in the group will say, no, I'm going to put your mask on and put your mask on and put your mask on. But what happens is by the time you get to that third person, you pass out from the lack of oxygen, right? So the idea is, to fix your own mask first, so then I can be helpful. And that applies with recovery principles as well, right? So again, they'll add, family members will say, what's the best thing I can do? And it's like, well, begin to work on yourself. And then as Jamie described and, and Steve described, then you start to learn that stuff, right? You learn to set those boundaries, you learn to uh, set limits, you learn to kind of begin to work on yourself and it actually improves the relationship as opposed to keeping that enmeshment right that that lack of wind so to speak but it allows you both to to work on yourself and then you both begin to heal and you can kind of come together and and we see that beautifully with steve and, and jamie both of them kind of work in their own program and they're coming together and again and you guys are a great example as well with preston and tyson you guys work in your own programs they work theirs and then you can come together as a family once everyone's kind of working on their own stuff rather than trying to run each other's program or point things out. It's like looking at myself. And as Wayne Dyer says, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so as you work on yourself, it can change your perspective. And again, that's how you see the hand of a higher power in this, right? And, and God is the ultimate alchemist can take these tragic traumatic situations and change it for our good where it mutually benefits all of us. And again, it kind of like what Justin was saying too was, you know, his greatest um, uh, tragedy in this life has now become his greatest gift. And, you know, same with Preston and myself and, and everyone that works in recovery, it's like turned on its head. So again, working on ourselves can really help give us that, that space that we need to kind of thrive and become our highest and best selves. Thank Thanks, you so Matt. Matt. And you know, what's really cool, those of you who are new, um, 
don't be overwhelmed. But one thing that's nice about attending the family education groups at a treatment center is you're going to start hearing a lot of these terms of, of how to set boundaries and how to detach from the chaos, but how to encourage in an appropriate way and learn that fine line between what's helpful and what's hurtful. So um, everything you're hearing mm -hmm. tonight, as you start engaging and working your steps and working your own program, your vocabulary with your loved one is good. Your, the communication will be so much better. It's like you're speaking the same language. So let's mm -hmm. get to some questions. Yeah. Uh, Press, did you have a comment? I think I cut you off a minute ago or, or, or not, but you, maybe yeah. you can share how to get to yeah. the app yeah. or the recovery I, app. Okay. So I, I um, one of the, someone sent me, I think it was a, a private QA asking how to get a sponsor or one of the family members. And I was going to have uh, oh, good. She's back. Hi, Jamie. I was gonna I was gonna pass the question to you. Um, someone uh, PM'd me on the on the chat and asked how to get a sponsor, a family member to get a sponsor, and so I thought I'd, I'd pass that to you. You'd pr you'd probably be able to answer that better than I could. Yeah, um, I was suggested at the beginning to go to Al-Anon and just keep going to meetings and be prayerful about it and take your higher power with you. And when someone is sharing in a meeting or they're um, talking or teaching to just have an open heart and open mind and be prayerful about it and you'll know. And that has been manifested to me twice. The first time I tried it, it was like probably the first meeting I ever went to, the first al -Anon meeting. And I was like, yes, I'm going to get a sponsor. And the first girl who spoke, I'm like, okay, I'll ask her. So I asked her right afterwards. And she was like, I'm actually not even in a place to sponsor. And instantly it like shot my my ego. And I was like so embarrassed. And I thought, okay, wait, I'm actually going to be a little more prayerful about this and take my time. And so I did. And it the next time I asked somebody, I my heart was so ready and just oh, so open to it. And the second she spoke, I just knew that she needed to, that she just, it just related to me. And what was she was saying resonated with me. And I felt so strongly in my heart, I should ask her. And it took so much courage. It was really hard for me to ask because I was so nervous this time because I was afraid of rejection. But I asked her and, um, but then instantly, as soon as I asked her, she's, I started saying, oh, but I feel bad. You don't have, you have, you're sponsoring other people. You don't have time. And she was like, so good she said you have no idea what i have time for my answer was yes i was like okay, okay thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> jamie thank you so much awesome. we also have a women's program now um on thursdays at noon and a lot of those women are hardcore al-anon women and ranch women and they their sponsors on there and in our family groups now we are starting to ask for sponsors in the group to put their name and phone number in the chat. So that's helpful. This is the workbook. All of our open family groups use this workbook. It's called Healing Through Christ, Help, Hope, and Healing for Those Who Have Loved One in Addiction. What I love about this workbook is there's over 131 authors and 80 books that are referenced. It's powerful. It brings the best of the best from all around the world. But in the appendix, it tells you how to find a sponsor, gives you all the information, how to become a sponsor. It's, it's fantastic and all the topics and themes that we as family members are just like yearning to learn and know about. Mm -hmm. And that's a nonprofit and you go to healingthroughchrist.org to get that. So um, mm -hmm. that's another resource. Thanks, hon. Yeah. Hey, uh, Justin, I, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting. I've been thinking what Preston said and then with your story. Preston, you said addiction is a counterfeit for God's love. You know, when you're in a home, Justin, where you've been, and I see that we were just at the ranch um, Monday. Monday night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was talking with one individual who suffered greatly. He, his story reminds me so much of you. In fact, Tim, uh, you talk with him today, Justin. And um, here's a guy that, that, that's angry uh, with God. He's angry with his family. He didn't receive love. Um, that is a similar story to you. Addiction is a counterfeit for God's love. Addiction is a counterfeit for mom and dad's love. Um, that's, it seems, um, Justin, what happened? The, the question is, how did you feel that? Because we use our drug of choice to numb out these shameful feelings to fill as they, they say this hole. 
you you were in the deepest of the holes. Now it took you a minute to dig out. Maybe just put a little bit more meat on that bone to give those who maybe are on here some hope for for the addict that's been to one or two treatment centers that that really struggle and 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 maybe how you did that and maybe what we do in the rash to help that type of person if you want or whatever not and, just a couple minutes and yeah. if i could just share if you have any questions just go ahead and put them in the chat <clears throat> and we're, we're watching for those questions yeah so thank you yeah thanks rick and you know when when i think about you know the love the counterfeit love i guess that i got from from the addiction and from other people um and what i had to do to receive god's love uh, it it came at me not fast but slow i i had to start with some suggestions from a sponsor in one of the treatment centers actually the very first sponsor that i ever had um it was a similar story to jamie's like i had asked a sponsor and he said oh no i'm not taking people right now and my my ego like my i just deflated i'm just like oh god that was so embarrassing like i'm never gonna ask anyone else um but i did um one of the suggestions that he gave me was to to do steps you know 10 and 11 more importantly step 11 in in the alcoholics anonymous book and i looked at him and i says well i'm i'm supposed to be working on step one and he said well is it making any sense not really <laughs> like i don't have a relationship with god um you know and he says well why don't you jump to step 11 and give it a shot you know so I, I read step 11 and it talks about, you know, in, in the morning, uh, you know, seek out God and pray, you know, review your day ahead of you, you know, where can you be of service to others? You know, what can you pack into the stream of life? Um, the other part of it is when you, you know, end your day, review your day, you know, pray to God. Um, and I did those things. I got on my knees in the morning, I rolled out of bed uh, at the treatment center and I, I felt really stupid, uh, embarrassed, you know, uh, getting on my knees and saying, you know, hey, God, um, I don't know how to pray to you, but, you know, I, I want your help, you know, help me to do the things that I don't want to do today. Help me to see, um, you know, and be open minded to, you know, new things, because what I'm doing right now sucks. And, and then I would get up and I do my day and I would hear things that would just kind of pierce my heart, you know, um, in a group or somebody commenting or in a meeting, uh, and it would stay with me. And then at the end of my day, I'd get on my knees before bed. Um, and I'd ask, I'd, I'd thank them, you know, thank you for helping me out today. Um, you know, what else can I do? And, and I just repeated that, um, that step 11 process of, you know, knees in the morning, knees at night. Uh, and finally, things just started to click. I, I remotivated myself. I would hear things. I would start to feel the love from God. Uh, I, I came, um, I became willing and I became open uh, to the program and the suggestions. And I guess just throughout, you know, over the years, like my relationship with God has grown and my relationship with, you know, others has, has grown too. So it wasn't, it wasn't like a huge spiritual awakening all at once. It was little efforts and time and, you know, working the 12 step program that really impacted my life. Mm, Thank you beautiful. so much, Justin. Slow process, but like a sunrise, yeah, a man. slow awakening. I love that. It gives that. hope. It does. Um, Thank we, you. we have time for one more question <clears throat> and I'd like to oppose this to uh, Jamie. You get your feelings on this and maybe some commentary from Matt and then Preston, if you have some feelings on this, what Jamie, you said, what, what really struck me is you says, letting go of my addiction to his addiction was the battle. Letting go of your addiction to his addiction. And couple that with, uh, you said both were addicts, both of us were addicts with different symptoms. I think a lot of times as, as family members, and this is what happened when our boys went into to recovery, uh, into treatment, boy, it wasn't my fault there. It was so easy for me to point 
until we got in and, and, and humbly looked at this and learned that addiction sprouts in emotionally dishonest families. And that's what we had, an emotional dishonest we scenario. We didn't know how to fix that. Um, but I, I think the story here with you, you guys is that that of recovery as a couple and as a family. Maybe again, just zero in a little bit real quickly about the idea of both were addicts with different symptoms, what maybe that looks like a little bit, maybe example or two, understanding that you had to let go of your addiction of his addiction and how those two might tie together. Uh, and then some commentary, Matt, maybe press from you and we'll, we'll, we'll close it down. <clears throat> Yeah, that's actually a great question. I've had a lot of people ask me that because I've um, had some friends who knew me my whole life and um, I never really um, outwardly made any, I guess what people would call poor choices, right? Um, and so people would say, I don't understand why you're doing this. Like, why do you call yourself an addict? Um, like, you, what, have, what have you done wrong, you know? And I think addiction has been just so traditionally viewed as um, making this that, you know, like being bad and doing bad things rather than, I mean, addiction is a feelings disease. And so when you think of it that way, and you think of that, that emotional dishonesty and, um, in terms of emotional sobriety and trying to get to a point where we're being honest about our feelings and, um, really my addiction to his addiction was, um, I would get a rush from it, to be honest. So um, just to shed a little bit of light on what that was like, my addiction to his addiction is I would actually, when I, when I would ask him and I knew something was off and I would ask him if he's, if he's using, and I would just try to find clues and try to figure it out. And he would tell me, no, no, I'm good. I'm doing so good right now. And this is what I'm doing and look how good I'm doing. But I just knew something was off. It's kind of like, um, for me, that's, it was as toxic as seeking out pills, pills and looking for my drug. And my drug came when I would find, you know, his pills, I would find a stash of something, I would um, put a mirror under the door and watch him in the bathroom, like things, crazy things like that, I wanted to prove. And the second I got that it was like this adrenaline rush, it was a high for me. It truly was an addiction and looking back on it is just, you can see the the craziness in that and the, and the flawed thinking of thinking that I was going to help because I was going to, was going to solve this. I was going to figure it out, but it was my addiction. It truly did become my addiction. I would, I would sneak, he would fall asleep and I'd get this adrenaline rush and I'd sneak over and look at his phone, things like that. So that was my, my addiction, but um, that was just covering up what maybe I would have been something else had I not been addicted to his addiction. And that, that became true, you know, I, I, then I realized this codependency and then starting to let go of that, I picked up food. It was almost like grasping for anything. My, my little heart was just like, well, give me something to numb out these feelings. And so it was like what Matt said, when I was willing to get down to the causes and conditions, that's when the healing really started to happen. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter if it was my addiction to him, my addiction to food, my addiction to um, controlling, to um, obsessing adrenaline. I've just discovered so many addictions in myself. It really was the um, the willingness to get down to causes and conditions and and face my feelings and face my heart. Mm, oh my yeah, goodness. Jamie. Thank you that, so much, that, Jamie. That's wonderful. Well, listen, I just want to make one quick announcement. We're going to be wrapping this up really fast, but Jamie and her kids that have been in Alateen have agreed to do a once a month Alateen meeting for our family education groups. And so we're super excited about that. And what a great time to um, start implementing that in our program. So we appreciate that. And we're so looking forward. It's going to be for kids from eight to 18. And there's not a lot of help for these, these youth and these teens. And it'll just be part of our free family education program. So Jamie, thank you so much to you and your family and Steve. And um, Rick, did you have any other? Yeah, Matt, your, your comment on, uh, on what um, Jamie just talked about a little bit. Yeah, so um, what I define addiction as uh, any addiction to any mood altering, mind altering substance or behavior. So it's not just chemicals, right? It can be substance or behavior. And oftentimes, and like I was sharing these codependent enmeshments, uh, we can be addicted to the chaos. And you see this a lot, um, like when a loved one comes into treatment and sometimes 
um, the wife or the mom or someone will be like, um, okay, well, they can come home now. They said I can come home. And it's like when the person, they, they think they want the loved one to get help, they go in to get help. And then pretty soon it's like, well, who am I? Because That's my they, role. Yeah. yeah, it's like if they don't need me to be needed, then who, who am I? And I got to look at myself and I don't want to do that. So it behooves me to stay in this level of dysfunction over and over again. And so that's kind of what Jamie is talking about is, man, once her drug of choice, Steve's behavior was gone, it's like I'm left to, man, look at myself and nobody likes to do that, right? And we have a lot of socially acceptable addictions. Workaholism looks like you're just awesome. You know, service addictions, we see a lot of those where again, the behavior looks great or working out or whatever it is. There's just a number of, anytime we're trying to avoid our feelings and emotions, that can be an addiction itself, right? And it's just, it's just like chemicals or substances, uh, behavior addictions are just the same. Another great one is uh, shopping addiction, like Amazon. It's the rush of like buying something and then you wait for the package and then you get the package and then it's like, oh, now I gotta buy something else. So what you're purchasing is a feeling and that's what we do over and over again. It's like, man, well, why am I, anytime I reach out of myself for an internal solution, it's always gonna be empty and I'll keep reaching out, keep reaching out, keep reaching out. And that's why the blackout is so important at the beginning when, when the guys come into treatment, it's not only for them, but it's for the family members as well to kind of everybody calm down for a second and kind of get in touch with what their feelings and emotions. And so, and that could be a struggle, kind of what Jamie is saying is kind of figure out, well, who am I, you know, and having to really take a look at myself and what am I doing behavior wise to avoid what my feelings and emotions. So. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Matt. That was wonderful. Hey, you guys, um, we need to wrap it up. This was powerful. Um, and I just can't tell you how grateful we are for your stories, for your recovery, for the vulnerability that you shared and uh, where you are as, as leaders in recovery and uh, at the ranch. So, so, so much appreciated. Thank you for um, all of our attendees. Thanks for all too. our attendees. And remember, we don't have any classes the rest of this week because of this webinar. Classes will resume next week. Classes Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday at noon for women. So uh, please remember that. Um, I'm going to close in 15 seconds. Let me get inside your heart for just a minute. I just need to make an announcement oh, too. Go ahead if you're quick. new and you're not getting the weekly emails with the Zoom links to our classes, you can just email me, Christine at renaissanceranch.com. It's just my personal email list and I'll make sure and get you the Zoom link every week. There's also beautiful handouts and videos and education that will just help you to start this process. Yeah. So thank you for all attending tonight. Okay. Just, just listen and, and, and feel these words. This is from Russell M. Nelson. He says, difficult trials prov often provide opportunities to grow that would not have come any other way. Can I, can I say that again? Difficult trials often provide opportunities to grow that would not have come in any other way. He says, the voice of the Lord is not a voice of great tumultuous noise, but it's a still small voice of perfect mildness, like a whisper, and it pierces even to the very soul. In order to hear this still voice, you too must be still. You know, our prayer is that you can be still in your heart and be guided by your higher power, by your heavenly father to do the things that will help you in your recovery, to help support your family, your loving addict. Uh, we're grateful for all of you for sticking with us. Thanks so much. Have a great night and we'll see you in the upcoming classes. Again, everybody, thank you for attending and speakers, thank you for helping us tonight in our recovery. You guys have a great night. Take care have now. Have a good night. We'll see you next week right. in our classes. Thank you so much. Thank you to our beautiful webinar panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thanks, guys. everybody. Let us know if you have any questions. Thank you.